Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Welcome to worship this evening. We begin our worship in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Opening hymn for this evening is hymn 384. We're going to sing stanzas 1, 3, and 4. 1, 3, and 4. side cover of our worship bulletin as we join together in the confession of our sins. Dearly loved by the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins to God our Father, asking him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. For this I deserve your punishment, both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins, and trusting in my Savior, Jesus Christ, I pray. Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to us and has given His only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by His authority, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We join together in the singing of the Gloria in Excelsis.
let us join our hearts together in prayer. Lord God, you have always kept your word perfectly. We thank you that Jesus came as foretold and fulfilled everything he was sent to do and that was written about him in the word, especially saving us from our sins and giving us eternal life. We thank you and ask this in his holy name, he who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, ever one God, world without end. On this third week in Epiphany, we continue to see Jesus both in prophecy and in fulfillment continue to function as the Messiah. And as he appears at the uh, synagogue in Nazareth and speaks to them and says, Today this scripture is fulfilled, as he reads from the Old Testament prophet Isaiah. Our Old Testament lesson for this evening is recorded in Isaiah, the 61st chapter, beginning at verse 1. The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me, because the Lord has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives, and release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, and provide for those who grieve in Zion, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. They will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor. They will rebuild the ancient ruins and restore the places long devastated. They will renew the ruined cities that have been devastated for generations. Aliens will shepherd your flocks. Foreigners will work your fields and vineyards. And you will be called priests of the Lord. You will be named ministers of our God. You will feed on the wealth of nations, and in their riches you will boast. Here ends our Old Testament lesson. Our psalm for the day is taken from portions of Psalm 103. We begin by singing the refrain. countryside. He taught in their synagogues, and everyone praised him. He went to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and on the Sabbath day he went into the synagogue, as was his custom. And he stood up to read. The scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him, and he began by saying to them, Today this scripture is fulfilled 
in your hearing. Here ends our gospel lesson. We now join together on the top of page 4 in the confession of our faith according to the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We now turn to our sermon hymn for this evening, hymn number 730, 730. <laughs> this evening is recorded in our epistle lesson taken from the first letter to the church in the city of Corinth the 12th chapter beginning at the 12th verse the body is a unit though it is made up of many parts and though all its parts are many they form one body so it is with Christ for we were all baptized by one spirit into one body whether Jews or Greeks slave or free and we were all given the one spirit to drink. Now the body is not made up of one part, but of many. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason cease to be a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason cease to be a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has arranged the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If they were all one part, 
where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, but one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. And the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And the parts that we think are less honorable, we treat with special honor. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. These are the words of our Lord. In the name of our Savior, dear Christian friends, have you ever heard or said something like this? Who needs you anyway? Take your ball and go home. And sometimes, after arguments or trouble between people, and people separate because of uh, they've had a tiff and are in a huff. Sometimes we and people are tempted to think, I don't need you. I don't need you. And even though we may be tempted, uh, Paul reminds us in our text for tonight that we need to guard, our, get, guard ourselves against such temptations and to think, I don't need somebody. And he reminds us just who needs who. Who needs who? And in the first part, he reminds us that we are a part of the body of Christ, and yet there's many parts. And then, in the second part, he reminds us every part is different. And finally, God gave us all to the church and to each other for the common good. In the first part, we note that the body of Christ is one body, but many parts. Paul said, the body is a unit, though it is made up of many parts. And though all its parts are many, they form one body. So it is with Christ. For we were all baptized by one spirit into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, slave or free, and we were all given the one spirit to drink. As it was in Corinth, as Paul was writing this to them, so it is here tonight. We're all different in our different ways. Um, Paul spoke of Jews or Greeks, slave or free. In the letter to the Galatians, he said male or female. And we're all different ages. We all have different talents and abilities. We all have different interests. We have different backgrounds. But you know what? Uh, in Exonia, I don't think there's too many different cultures represented uh, in Exonia. There's a lot of German heritage and maybe uh, European heritage, but we still are all uniquely different. Now, whether back in Corinth or, or here in Exonia, the Lord reminds us all as Christians that he says the body's a unit made up of many parts. So Corinth was a local <coughs> unit. Our churches, our two churches here in Exonia, they're local units, and so are every other church. So how did we become members of this body, of this body of Christ? Was it because we were so smart that we decided, eh, I should join? Was it because you or I made our decision for Christ and we came to this body of our own accord? And that's not the case either. Holy Spirit is very clear. You know, it's still football season. And using a football analogy, analogy, was it because some scouts from church saw us and recruited us because we thought we'd have potential as a member? No. It's because the Spirit of God brought us into the body of Christ. We would not have been a part of this body unless God himself had done it. We can thank God that to his credit alone, he brought us in, and the, here the text says, through baptism. He washed us of all of our sins. He gave us the gift of faith. He made us who we are, a new creation. And we've been given the gift of the Holy Spirit, and now we're saved. We have eternal life. We have the gift of salvation given to us from God himself and are members of his eternal family. So, one of the temptations that often arises when there's diversity or differences 
is that sinful human nature will often be tempted to wrongly turn differences and diversity into divisions and divisiveness. And so the Apostle Paul reminds us, introducing this first part, that it's God who brought us into the body of Christ, and he did it through all those wonderful things that he's done for us. Baptism, one of us. One of them. And now in the second part, not only does he now remind us we all are different, nobody's personality here tonight is the same. Are you ever going to bump into a person whose personality is just like yours? It's rare. Oftentimes people like that uh, seem to click, best friends, things like that. But there's nobody like us. Now he goes on. Those differences can sometimes turn into causes for division. So now he continues. Now the body is not made up of one part, but of many. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason cease to be a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I don't belong to the body, it would not for that reason cease to be a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? So the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. So please note who's telling us we're all different. It's God. God's telling us we're all different. And how did that happen? Well, he made us that way. But another thing we have to know, and it's a, it's a warning from the Apostle. Sometimes we are not even content with how God made us. Sometimes we are not content with how God made us. If the foot should say, I'm not a hand. If the ear should say, I'm not an eye. So Paul's reflecting that, that a part of the body of Christ says, well, I'm not like them. So I'm not part of the body. Discontentment with how God made them. So it's too easy to look at somebody else and say, I wish I was like them, or I wish I had their gifts or their abilities or their talents. How many times, uh, or sometimes we even say, I wish I had their looks. How many times have we looked in the mirror and thought, oh, I don't like this or I don't like that. And, and again, sometimes we are not content with who we are. And we look at others and say, how come I'm not like that? That kind of thinking and really what it is doing, it's questioning God. is wrong, and Paul reminds us, don't fall into these temptations and these thoughts that are not going to help. They're not going to help the body of Christ, and they're not going to help us in our life. The Apostle Paul, in a letter to the Romans, reminded them, don't be discontented with who you are. He said it this way. It's kind of stern. But who are you, O man, to talk back to God? Shall what is formed say to him who formed it, why did you make me like this? And that's a stern rebuke. Another thing. And I think it's a thought we should uh, bring up here because it kind of fits this context. And we're not even a month past Christmas. The Sunday's the 23rd, so we're not even a month past Christmas. So I want to point out something to you. One of the uh, prophecies regarding the coming Christ, Jesus, in the prophet Isaiah, said this about him. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. Now I studied that verse over again because it was always popping up in the back of my mind while I was studying this text. And it sounds like, yes, even physically, there was nothing about Jesus that people would have said, oh, that's a handsome guy. Or that it was pleasing features. 
In other words, an advertising exec looking at a lineup of people with Jesus in there probably may not have picked him out to be a spokesman for their product. So it's just a thought. It's just something to consider in this whole text. Now the facts about each of us, the facts that God says from Holy Scriptures, you're a completely unique person. There will never be another you in the entire history of the world. Now, we got how many billion of people right now, right? And how many billions have gone before us? And how many are going to come after us before the end of the world? There will never be another person like you in the entire history of the globe. You're the only person that will ever have those fingerprints, that iris in your eye. You are the only person who will ever sound like you sound when you talk. You're the only person who sometimes maybe has that laugh or that wit. Because you are completely, as the Bible says in the Psalms, fearfully and wonderfully made, and he fashioned each of us in our mother's womb. So we're completely unique. You're the only one. You know that, that goofy saying about God breaking the mold? He did. When he made each of us, even if it's identical twins, they aren't the same. Many times you have different personalities, different interests, different likes. So a stark reminder of this fact is when the Lord had sent Moses down to Egypt with the command to bring my people out. And Moses was coming up with a lot of excuses. He didn't want to do it. And one of them he said is, I can't talk. I can't speak. So and thus implying, I can't go. And the Lord replied to Moses with this. He said, who gave man his mouth? Who makes him deaf or mute? Who gives him sight or makes him blind? Is it not I, the Lord? So the fact of the matter is God says that if a person is born blind, he is the one who did it. He is the one who fashioned him that way. And from uh, hearing uh, about people who have these disabilities, usually when one of those five senses is taken away, it seems like the other senses are heightened. A person who is a blind, uh, sometimes their hearing is so acute. I remember watching a blind person dealing cards on Johnny Carson, and from the feel of his fingertips, as he was dealing out the cards, he could feel which card he gave everybody. And he did it. The same guy said, there's seven kinds of waves. Interesting stuff. So when the Lord fashions each of us, it's as he's deemed fit. You are who you are because God created us that way. Now, of course, these facts do not account for possibly bad habits or sinful habits where the doctor's telling us, you've got to lose a few pounds or you've got to stop smoking or you've got to stop drinking or whatever. Uh, we can have bad habits, but for the fact of the matter is God made us who he wanted us to be. Uniquely. And we're individual creations of God. So now Paul tells us in the third part, you and I and the others in our body of Christ were given for the common good. But in fact, Paul continues, God has arranged the parts of the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part's honored, every part rejoices with it. Now, you are, you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. You know, if St. Mark's was all a bunch of electricians in this congregation, We'd probably have the best wiring and the safest church in the world as far as electric, electricity goes. But where would the rest of it all be? So we are all brought in as members of this body. And it says, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. So all of us are here because of God's working and joining us together. And he made us a unit and, or with many parts as believers here at church. And Paul speaks of that practical example 
about suffering and rejoicing together depending upon the circumstances, like a human body. If you have a painful hangnail, how does it affect the rest of the body? If you have a bad canker sore, how does it affect the rest of the body? If you have a bad headache, backache, whatever, it all kind of suffers together. If one part of your leg is bad you're, and you're limping and you're, it affects everything. So, you and I reminded, we were reminded of that too, I as a pastor, when Leroy was in the hospital. You know, people would text, people would call, how's Leroy doing, you know, or, you know, people would be able to talk maybe at twice as nice, or whatever. Or they'd say, how are the daughters doing? And everybody was kind of concerned and suffering along with the family and concerned for what was going to happen. So this text has a ton of reminders for us as a church. And he reminds us, give thanks to God, first of all, about who we are, that he made us, that he made us his own, that he called us to faith through the Holy Spirit in the water of baptism and that word. And he made us who we are spiritually, too, one of his kids. Secondly, remember to thank God for each other. And all of our brothers and sisters in the Christian church, they're all gifts to his church from God himself. And third of all, he reminds us that each of us has been given to the others for the common good. We're all blessings to each other. And God says it that way. So the Apostle Paul reminds us who needs who. Who, just who needs who? And the fact of the matter is, God brought us all together because it was his determination that we need each other. So, despite all the times that we haven't listened to God, and at times we've thought or even said to somebody, I don't need you, what did Jesus do? What did he do for us? He suffered for us. He died for us. And when the Bible says he died for us, it uses it in both senses. Because um, for you can be used either in the plural or in the singular. Christ died for you. And he died for you individually, and he died for all of us as a group. Think of how in the communion, he says, given for you, poured out for you, for the forgiveness of sins. So as we come to the Lord's table, both individually and collectively, we're given his body and blood to eat and drink, for that assurance that we are forgiven. And we all do this together, in a common confession, as part of the one body that he's made us. And also, what did Jesus promise us in John 14? What did Leroy inherit? And Jesus promised us all, individually and collectively as believers, a room, a mansion in heaven. And that's the gift he gives us because he suffered and died for us and made us his own and brought us into his kingdom. So finally, pray for each other. Sometimes we pray because one of the parts of the body of the church is suffering. And who knows, you know, when sickness, tragedy, or something else is struck, how awesome is it to hear that fellow brothers and sisters in Christ are praying for you? What, what a comfort that all these prayers are ascending to God's throne from all of these other parts of Christ's body. And it's also great when we can rejoice together and pray to God on behalf of, for instance, a couple who's able to celebrate their 40th, 50th, or whatever anniversary, or their 80th or 85th birthday, or the blessing of a new baby. All these are awesome things that we can rejoice about as part of the body of Christ. So may we continue to remember who needs who. They all need you, and you all need them. That's what the Apostle Paul is impressing upon us tonight. They all need you, and you all need them. 
important words coming from the Lord who made us one. And John talked about that great countless throng standing before the Lamb and before the throne on that last day. A countless throng that are going to be all singing praises to the Lord together as one group, redeemed and bought by the blood of Christ. So look forward to that. We always have been one as brothers and sisters in Christ. Our sinful natures may get in the way a couple of times, but the apostle reminds us, try not to let that happen. And when we do, thank goodness we have a forgiving Lord who suffered and died for us so that we get to live with him. Amen. May the peace of God which surpasses all understanding keep and guard your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. We now turn to page 5 in our worship bulletin as we join together in the singing of Create in Me. church we thank you that you made us your own by washing us of all of our sins and calling us to the gift of faith as you have reminded us today that you have made us one in this body of Christ and gave us to each other as gifts to your church help us in our attitudes and actions to receive each other with thanks to pray for each other and to realize that this unity stretches into all eternity as Christ, our head, who suffered and died for our sins, did so in love, may we also show love for each other as Christ has loved us. May we also continue to reach out to many others with your holy word, so that everyone may know your truth and your salvation. We ask this all in Jesus' name, who has also then taught us to pray. Our, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. We continue with uh, hymn 930 for our closing hymn, 930.
Court, welcome everyone this evening. Glad to have you with us.